Yes, in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, as we gather here today, we pause to uh, place ourselves in your presence to thank you for the many blessings that you bestow upon each and every one of us every day of our lives. We pray that we might be able to truly open our eyes and see these blessings and never take them for granted. May our conversation today and everyone who listens to this uh, interview be inspired to draw more closely to you, especially now that you've entered the holy season of Lent. And as in all things, we do everything for your greater glory. And again, we ask your blessing upon all of us in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is a blessing for all of us because one of the uh, famous exorcist priests in America welcome us uh, to this interview. And I'm sure he will share a lot with us to help us in our spiritual life. We'll share wisdom that comes from God. And I know uh, many of you already know our guest for the day. And I personally can't believe that I can interview him today. This is a great honor and a privilege for all of us. And are you excited to meet our guest? Our guest for today is the pastor of St. Michael and St. Peter Parishes in Brookville, Indiana. In 2005, he was appointed the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. And he received his training in Rome and is a member of the International Association of Exorcists. He is the author of Exorcism, The Battle Against Satan and His Demons. So without further ado, let's all welcome our guest for today, Father Beans Lampert. Good morning, Adrian. It's good to be with you today. Yeah, Father, you're such a blessing for all of us for this interview. And Father, can you first greet our Filipino viewers? Yes, hello to all the viewers in the Philippines. It's great to be with you today. I hope this conversation inspires everyone to draw more closely to the Lord. Because as an exorcist, really what it's about is not focusing on what the devil is trying to do in our lives, but more importantly, to focus on what God wants to do in our lives. Amen. So, Father, I'm curious because you received the training in, in Rome. Is Father Gabriel Amert pers personally trained you? I met him when I was in Rome. So, I met yeah. Father Gabriel Amort. He was the former chief exorcist in Rome. He was very instrumental in starting the International Association of Exorcists, which today is made up of more than probably 750 priests and their helpers from throughout the oh. world. So, I think Father Gabriel Amorth is really the one who helped bring exorcism back into the modern day spotlight. Yes. So you became his apprentice. <laughs> oh, I, I actually trained under another priest, oh. his name, Father Carmine de Philippus, mm. but he's a Franciscan priest. But both Father Carmine and Father Gabriel Amorth were trained by Father Candido Amantini. He was a passionist priest who did exorcisms at the Holy Stairs in the city of Rome near the Basilica of St. John Lateran. So Father Andrew Amentini trained Father Amorth, and he also trained Father De Philippus, who then trained me. Wow. Uh, thank you for that information, Father, because I read your uh, introduction and your training is from Rome. <laughs> yes. So, so Father, uh, can you give us a, a brief background about yourself? Yes, I was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis in 1991. So coming up on June the 1st will be my 32nd anniversary of being ordained a priest. And then 18 years ago, in 2005, the Archbishop of Indianapolis appointed me to be the exorcist. And then, as you mentioned, I received my training in Rome. Father Carmen A. Philippus allowed me to sit in on 40 exorcisms that he performed during the three months that I lived in Rome. And then that allowed me to become more acquainted with how to help someone who is up against the forces of evil and is seeking the help of the church. Mm -hmm. So, um, Father, I'm curious, what was your life uh, before you became a Catholic priest? 
So I grew up in the city of Indianapolis. I have eight brothers and sisters. So I have six brothers and two sisters. I'm number seven out of nine. We grew up in a traditional devout Catholic family. My mother was a convert. She ah. grew up Catholic, but when she married my dad, she became Catholic. We attended Catholic schools, grade school, oh. Catholic secondary school, and then I attended a seminary in Indiana, and then major seminary in the city of Chicago. Do you also come to the point that you were deviated from that spot? Absolutely. You know, when I, after I finished secondary school, I went to uh, Indiana University. Mm. And after two years at university, I realized God was calling me to become a priest. So then I left Indiana University and went to a Benedictine seminary in Southern Indiana, where I finished my undergraduate degree. Mm. I then, I quit the seminary for two years, but uh, oh. you can run from God, but you can't run far. <laughs> Amen. If uh, you're truly going to do what God wants you to do. So after two years out of the seminary, I realized that I couldn't run away from God anymore. So I finished my seminary studies in Chicago and then was ordained in 1991. People ask me, Father, why did you become a priest? And yes. the answer is very simple, because it's what I believe God wanted me to do. And if God yes. wants you to do something, we need to do it. And we also have to realize that God will give us the strength that we need to do the work that he calls us to do. Amen. Uh, Father, I'm curious, uh, you say yes to God's call to become a priest. So what struck you in your heart that uh, makes you decide to, to be all out for the Lord? I think the uh, our relationship with God is the most important relationship that any one of us can have. I think of St. Augustine when he says, our, you know, you made us for yourself, O oh God, and our hearts are restless until they Amen. rest in you. So the human person needs to be in a relationship with God in order to really find meaning, purpose, and direction in this life and experience the joy that God wants all of us to have. So as a priest, I want to help people connect with God in their life and discover what God wants to do for them as well. Mm. Wow. How did you become an, an exorcist priest? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm laughing because I jokingly tell people that I became the exorcist because I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the Archdiocese of Indianapolis has always had a priest as an exorcist. Mm. Even when it fell out of practice after the Second Vatican Council that ended in 1965, Indianapolis has always had a priest in this role. In fact, it was the parish priest where I attended grade school who was the exorcist and that he passed away in 2005 and my archbishop who also happened to be my seminary rector when I was in college seminary became my bishop so he knew me and he said that he was looking for a priest who believed in the reality of evil but mm -hmm. not one who would believe that everyone who came to me was actually dealing with the forces of evil Maybe they were having some mental health issue or maybe a physical issue. So he thought that I would be a priest who would be well-balanced in mm. helping people discern whether or not they were truly dealing with the demonic. Oh, what's the process? Do you expand immediately? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, the, the bishop is the exorcist in every diocese. Yes. He has that authority based on Luke's Gospel in chapter 9 where Jesus sends out the 12 and he gives them authority over every unclean spirit. And we know that the bishops are the successors to the apostles, so that authority resides with them. And then a bishop at his discretion may appoint one or more of his priests to do this ministry mm. in his name. When I was appointed, I became one of only 12 exorcists in the United States. And the church says the best way to learn is through the apprenticeship model yes. to work under a seasoned exorcist. But because there were so few in the United States, which is why my bishop sent me to Rome, and then I was able to connect with uh, Father Carmine de Philippus, the Franciscan priest, who then permitted me to sit in on exorcisms that he performed. Whoa. Wow. 
So, what is your uh, first baptism of fire? I mean, the, your first <laughs> encounter. You know, Father Carmine was the pastor of St. Lawrence Parish outside the walls of the city of Rome. So every day I would walk down to the Fountain of Trevi if people have ever been to the city of Rome. And then I would catch a bus, take a 15-minute bus ride out to the church. And uh, Father Carmine would have people. There was always about 50 people outside of his office. Some of them had appointments. Some did not have one. But they were hoping to be able to speak with him and to have him pray over them. The very first exorcism I witnessed was I was talking with this elderly Italian woman and her husband, and she was telling me why she was possessed. And as I'm talking to her, I'm thinking, there doesn't seem to be anything unusual about this. But Father Carmine walks into the room and he puts a roll of paper towels on the table. He walks back out again. He comes in again and ties a plastic grocery bag onto the wall radiator. He walks back out again and I'm looking at him out of one corner of my eye and I'm talking to this lady and he comes back in again and he's wearing his Franciscan brown robes and then he has a purple stole over his neck, the sign of his priestly office. He has the ritual of exorcism in his hand and holy water in the other and he takes the holy water and he blesses this lady and as soon as the drops of water hit her forehead, her eyes rolled back in her head. She began to wow. grow and foam at the mouth. And then her eyes came back down again. And she's looking at me with this most horrible hatred look. And she begins howling and screaming. And I'm looking at, at this thinking, what in the world has my bishop gotten me into? <laughs> but Father Carmine, he didn't even flinch. He just kept on praying over her, the exorcism prayers. Oh, Wow. So, Father, what is the wildest thing you ever seen while doing an exorcism? I did an exorcism uh, a couple years ago here in the state of Indiana, here in the United States. And uh, when the demon manifested, the person's eyes turned green and their pupils became slanted like a serpent. And the voice came out of the person's mouth and said, because I told the person that Jesus was going to help them. And the voice said, who's he? He has no power over us. And then later on, when I started to do the exorcism, the demon looked at me and said, you can't get rid of us. We've been here too long and you're not strong enough. And then began to growl and snarl and all those other kind of unusual things. Hmm. When you experience exorcism, how do you process everything? You know, do you feel anxiousness, fear, or... Early on, yeah, being anxious and fearful. You know, the first time I did an exorcism, I'm thinking, where's the priest who trained me? You know, where can I turn to him? But it's just me now, so I have to rely on what I've learned. But, you know, over the years, I've become more acclimated. Everything that the devil does does not scare me or concern me because I know that the power of God is greater than the power of the devil. In an exorcism, there are many manifestations and all the manifestations yes. are meant to instill fear, such as eyes mm -hmm. rolled in the back of the head, foaming at the mouth, bodily contortions. Mm -hmm. I've done exorcisms where when the demon manifests, the person's body will drop to the floor and begin to slither like a snake. I've seen levitations where bodies will begin to rise up out of the air. The temperature in the room becomes much colder, very horrible stenches and smells. But again, all of these things are ways that the devil is trying to instill fear and yes. to shift the focus away from God in the ritual of exorcism because the devil is being like a child throwing a temper tantrum who wants all the focus placed on him. Yeah, because the devil is so legalistic. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that information, Father. And how to prove someone is possessed? In the United States, we follow a protocol an exorcist is trained to be a skeptic, so I should be the last person to believe that someone is truly dealing with extraordinary demonic activity. In fact, the church says that I need moral certitude, meaning beyond a doubt the person in front of me is truly possessed. So to help me get to that point, I will rely on people from the mental health profession. So the person is required to have some type of a 
psychiatric evaluation. Sometimes people hear that and they become disillusioned and they say, well, Father, you don't believe me. But the truth is, if someone is really possessed, they're going to need to be in a good mental state of mind in order to go through the ritual prayers of the church in the rite of exorcism. Step two of the protocol would be for the person to have a physical examination by their medical doctor to rule out any physical cause for what they are experiencing. Step three, I would do an intake questionnaire. I would ask them a series of questions trying to determine if this really is demonic, what was the entry point for the devil into someone's life? You know, did they dabble in the occult? Did they get caught up in the things of the entertainment industry? Were they cursed? Were they dedicated to a demon? Did they foster relationships with demons? So again, I'm trying to find the entry point because by knowing the entry point, I know what doorway needs to be closed in this person's life. And then step four of the protocol is probably the most important one, and that is helping the person to resume their spiritual life, either to reconnect with Christ or to come to him for the very first time. You know, we live in an age, Adrian, right now where faith is in decline in yes. the lives of many people. Even people who grew up in traditional Christian homes now say they're spiritual, but they no longer believe in God. They're almost going back to pre-Christian forms of worship. And in all these things, people can be exposing themselves to the world of the demonic. So again, I would say that casting the devil out is actually the easy thing to do. The harder thing is to make sure the person wants to invite God into their life. I think of the passage from Luke's Gospel in chapter 11 where it says, once the demon has been cast out, it goes and wanders through the arid wasteland, and then coming back and finding the house swept clean, meaning it's gone, but God has not been invited in. Then it goes and finds seven other demons worse than itself, and they come up and take residence in the person. So again, casting the devil out is the easy part. Getting the person to invite God in is the uh, much more difficult task. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you for that information, Father. And speaking of what uh, happened in our society today, uh, what can you say about the performance of Sam, Sam Smith and Kim Petras and Holy the Grammy? Have you watched yes, it? Yes. Is this satanic? What is the danger for those who celebrate and support this act? The devil wants to take the place of God. That was his fall. It's the sin of pride. The danger when people get involved in Satanism and glorify the devil and put on these parodies, if you will, like at the Grammys, is that they're mocking and blaspheming God while giving glory to the devil. And the devil, you know, his goal is he wants to take the place of God. I like to remind people that the devil is not an atheist. <laughs> the devil is not an atheist. The devil knows that God exists, Ooh. but he wants people to live as if God did not exist. So when people put on these parodies, like at the Grammys, they may think it's just all fun and entertaining. Entertainment, yes. But they're mocking God and either directly or indirectly giving glory and praise to the devil. And that's a very, very dangerous thing to do because the devil is not anyone's friend. Ultimately, he wants to destroy people's lives. And when people connect with the demonic in their life, Initially, they may think that things are going good, but eventually the bottom will fall out and their lives will begin to unravel and they will find themselves in the midst of all kinds of chaos. At that point, Father, so it could be an entry for demonic possession? Yes, absolutely, because people are basically giving glory and honor to the devil. And as you mentioned earlier, the devil is very legalistic. And if people give the devil certain rights over them, even if they do it indirectly, the devil is going to take advantage of that and claim his rights and make a connection with that person. I'm curious, Father, uh, if someone is possessed, but uh, that person is not Catholic, is the right still valid? 
I think the the answer would be yes, as long as they have that desire for faith. Uh-huh. You know, I currently receive 3,500 requests for help uh, from people every year. So I get an average of about 70 emails and phone calls and letters every wow. week from people all over the world who believe they're up against the forces of the devil and are seeking help. And over half of these people are not Catholic. They come from other Christian faith traditions, other world religions, or no faith background whatsoever. But in my process in working with them, you know, there's no such thing as an emergency exorcism. I would want to work with a person, get to know them. Do they have the desire to grow in faith? So if they're not Christian, they're not Catholic, do they have that desire to grow in faith? Now, there's a great line in Mark's gospel. There's a man whose son is possessed and the disciples are not able to cast the demon out. And, you know, Jesus says, well, only by fasting and prayer can this demon be cast out. But the father says to Jesus, please help my son if you can. And Jesus looks at the man and says, if? You know, the son's convulsing on the ground. The demon is possessing him. Jesus is not concerned about the boy. He's concerned about the father's lack of faith, which is why it's so important in working with someone who may be possessed in helping them to discover the importance of faith in their life. Because the father in that gospel story then says to Jesus, Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. So working with people who may be possessed, I want to focus on their unbelief to help them grow in faith so that the prayers of the church will truly be more effective in casting the demon out. In the case of Annalise Michel or the who, who portrayed the Emily, Emily Rose in the movie, some says that Annalise Michel is a very devout Catholic. So why is she possessed by the devil? I'm not sure the particulars with in that case, but there are many people who claim to be devout Catholics, but at the same time, they dabble in the world of the occult. Well, on one hand, they say that they're Catholic, but they're doing things like practicing magic, trying to place spells or curses on people, They go to see a medium or a psychic. Mm. So again, if one claims to be a devout practicing Catholic, but they're doing things that are contrary to the faith, meaning dabbling in the world of the occult, that could be the crack in their spiritual armor that's allowing the devil to get his way into their life. Mm. A scripture tells us very clearly, you know, in... 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Your opponent, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking yes. someone to devour. Resist him solid in your faith. So we have to be solid in our faith, and anything that is contrary to our Catholic faith needs to be rooted out of our lives. Why do you think God allowed possession? You know, the devil was cast out of heaven, but he wasn't cast out of creation. So God still uses the devil to fulfill his plans for salvation for all of us. Because, you know, possession, whereas the devil may think he's showing his power, in the rite of exorcism, God is able to show his power, which is greater than the power of the devil. So exorcism can also be a form of evangelization. When people witness the power of God, then they realize that the power of of the devil is absolutely nothing compared to the power of God. So it's a way of bringing people into a deeper relationship with God. There's also, Adrian, something known as uh, demonic oppression. Somebody Mm -hmm. being afflicted by the devil. Yes. They didn't do anything wrong but God is allowing that to happen. So demonic oppression is a gift from God. Now that may sound rather strange, but think of Job in the Old Testament. He didn't do anything wrong, but God permitted Satan to afflict him. And if people know the story of Job, he's put on sackcloth, he's sitting in ashes, his body is covered in sores. His wife says to him, curse God and die. 
And Job beats his breast and says, The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Meaning, Amen. if things be good, I glorify God. If things be bad, I glorify God. My personal circumstances mean nothing when it comes to God's rightful place in my life. And then because of his fidelity, Job is blessed a hundredfold. Think of St. Paul in the New Testament. He experienced oppression. He talked about the messenger from Satan who was sent to torment him to keep him from becoming proud. Yes. Many of the saints of the church in recent history, one of my favorites, Padre Pio. Padre Pio. He experienced all kinds of demonic attacks. Padre Pio used to call the devil Old Bluebeard. <laughs> and one night, Padre Pio wrote that he was trying to sleep and he heard all this noise in his room. It woke him up. He looked over in the corner and it was the devil. And he says, oh, it's only you, old Bluebeard. I thought it was somebody important. Then he rolled over and went back to sleep. Now, how many of us, if we thought the devil was manifesting in our room, did we actually just roll over and go back to sleep? Probably not too many of us. Yeah. If I see a devil, I will run fast. <laughs> Faster than a dog. <laughs> but I'm curious, Father, uh, have you ever seen uh, a real devil manifest, I mean, in front of you? Have you encountered that? Absolutely. Usually when a demon can be seen, mm. it's like the a very dark blob. It's the darkest dark that you can imagine. And I've seen these many times over the years. You know, an analogy that I would use, my brothers and I, when we were kids, we used to have these rubber balls that would glow in the dark. Yes. And we would put them up against the light bulb, and then we would turn off the light, and then the ball would glow. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the glow would start to fade away unless we put it back against the light. The devil, because he fell from heaven is no longer illumined by the glory of God. So he's fallen into darkness. We can say that like that glow-in-the-dark ball, he's completely faded out. And that's yeah. why it's really like a black hole when a demon is seen. And it's usually kind of a cloud or blob-type figure. But again, it's the darkest dark that you could ever, ever imagine. Because many of our viewers thought that the devil is... Uh, red and with horns. I think those images, those images come from the entertainment industry. You know, the devil can play on a person's memory and imagination. That's why we have to be careful about the thoughts that we put into our head about the devil, because he will use those images as a way to instill fear in us. So the devil, he's a purely spiritual creature. He doesn't really have a body like we have, but yes. he can take on appearances based on what he knows will terrify or scare us. So thinking of the devil as kind of this red figure with horns yes. and hooves and a tail and a pitchfork, mm -hmm. I mean, that would terrify anyone. Mm -hmm. So the devil, again, takes advantage of the thoughts and images that we put into our minds and he uses those against us. I'm curious, Father, what is the worst retaliation you experience from the devil? I wouldn't say, you know, the devil always tries to retaliate against mm -hmm. those who are working against him. So the devil knows priests and others involved in deliverance and exorcism ministry, and he will yeah. try to attack them. But I always remind myself that any attack that I get God must be permitting it to happen. And so I use that to my benefit. You know, an enemy will only attack at what he perceives to be our weak point. So if the devil is attacking me, he's allowing me to see a weakness in my own spiritual life. So I know what I need to do to put in some more time and effort to grow in holiness and virtue. So I've had it, you know, one time I gave a talk at a university in the state of New Jersey. And after that talk that evening when I went to bed, I experienced a demonic attack. Something very heavy was sitting on my chest and I knew that it was something evil. And I simply began to pray 
and to invoke the Holy Spirit, and as soon as I did that, it stopped immediately. So that taught me the importance of even the power of prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Thank you for that uh, perspective that you're giving to us, Father Pins. And what is the most powerful weapon that you use in the devil that so frightened them? I would say that our Blessed Mother is uh, a very powerful ally. Anybody experiencing demonic activity or attacks should always turn to the intercession of our Blessed Mother. You know, the devil is all about pride, but our Blessed Mother is all about humility. And humility will always defeat pride. So if you think about the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they were disobedient to God. When I think of our Blessed Mother, she was obedient. When the Archangel Gabriel appeared to Mary in the Annunciation and said, God has a plan for you, Mary responds, let it be done to me according to your word. So she reverses the disobedience of Eve, who became the mother of all the living, and Mary becomes the true mother of all the living, those who are saved. Think of uh, Jesus being crucified. And from the cross, he says to his mother, you know, behold your son and son, behold your mother. So Jesus has given his mother to all of us and the people of faith truly become the new living and Mary truly is our mother. So the devil hates obedience. He hates humility. And those are the main qualities and characteristics that we find in our Blessed Mother. Hello mga ka -faith. short commercial lang. Kung sa tingin mo na na-bless at na-inspire ka sa content na pinapanood mo ngayon, dito sa vlog na pinapanood mo ngayon, dito sa interview na pinapanood mo ngayon, please consider supporting me in Patreon. Alam nyo mga ka -faith, when you support me in Patreon, ay matutulungan nyo ako na makapag-produce pa ng mga ganitong klaseng vlog at interview na alam ko na makakatulong sa inyong Catholic faith. Kasi itong ginagawa ko ay hindi po libre to. Lahat to ay may cost. ba diba? Yung mga ginagamit ko sa editing, sa mga software, sa mga device na kailangan ko pang gamitin para mas mapaganda ko pa yung mga interview at content na gagawin ko. And through your help, through your support, ay mas matutulungan nyo ako na mas ma-improve lahat ng ginagawa natin dito sa ating online evangelization through your support in Patreon. Ano nga ba ang Patreon? Alam nyo, pag kayo ay nag-decide na isupport ako sa Patreon, ay uh, bibigyan ko kayo ng exclusive content na galing sa akin na pwede nyo ma-access at also uh, exclusive content na mula din sa mga kilalang Catholic speaker at mga na-interview ko dito sa aking vlog na hindi ko ina-upload sa YouTube at ma-access nyo lang to dito sa Patreon. If you want to be part of my Patreon group, ilalagay ko yung link sa taas or sa baba ng video na to or dito sa mismong vlog na to, ilalagay ko yung details na yun kung paano ka pwedeng maging part ng aking Patreon group. Thank you so much. So, pagpatuloy na natin yung pinapanood mo. God bless. I will uh, read some uh, question from our viewers. Okay. From Helen Do, Do Healing. My question to Father Vincent Lambert, uh, is it true that if a house is infested with those fallen angels, the blessings of good opportunities are black? Yeah, so if, if there's demonic activity within the home, yeah, then there really needs to be a blessing because blessings, something is commended to God. If, mm. if something is cursed, it's commended to the devil. So if there are fallen angels that are being active in a location, in a home or another place, the place needs to be blessed. And not just with a general blessing prayer, but with a very specific deliverance or exorcism prayer that's used on a location. You know, there are four different types of, de of extraordinary demonic activity. We've talked about possession. There is also uh, obsession, which are mental attacks 
vexation, which are physical attacks, and infestation, which is the presence of evil in a location or associated with an object. And yes, if there is a presence of evil in a location, it can prevent the goodness that God wants to bring into that home. So that presence of evil needs to be addressed. From Prince Acosta, uh, how is education about our spiritual battle important to the people, uh, the non-believers, and especially the youth of today? I think the uh, I like to tell people that I don't think the devil has upped his game today, but that more people today are willing to play the devil's game. And that's because faith is in decline, as we were talking about earlier. So again, the importance in all of this is for people to have a spiritual awakening. You know, one of the common symbols of any church is the ringing of a bell. And why the bell? It's reminding us that we need to wake up to the things of God and to be about the things of God, to live out our commitment to the Lord. And there are a lot of people today that are spiritually asleep. I also yeah. think there's a lot of people today that are searching for something. You look at the rise in addictive behavior, whether mm -hmm. it's not all drugs or pornography, people are trying to fill a void in their life, but we can't fill it with something that is sinful in nature. We can only fill it with the presence of God. So even in the world of exorcism, I encounter people who are Catholic, other Christians, other uh, believers from other faith, you know, world religions, and even non-believers. But in all of these things, I simply want to propose to them that God is the solution, the only solution to the problems that we are experiencing in our lives. And if we can turn to God and give God his rightful place in our lives, then we'll begin to see our lives coming together rather than being constantly broken. And Father, in your perspective, uh, as a man of God, do atheists go to hell? Do who go to hell? Do atheists, do atheists go to hell? Uh, I always think, well, it depends on if they are a true atheist. Because my experience is a lot of people who say they're an atheist, maybe aren't really an atheist. They're just saying that as a way to get a, a response from us or maybe they experienced something horrific in their life and it caused them to not fully understand God. Maybe somebody had a tragedy where a family member was, was killed or they died in an accident and they blame God for that. So they say, well, I'm gonna be an atheist. I won't believe in God because God allowed this to happen. So to me, when somebody tells me they're an atheist, I always wanna to say to them, tell me the rest of the story. I encountered a woman one time, for example, who told me she was an atheist. But as I began talking with her and getting to know her, she told me that her son had been killed in a very horrific train accident, that his car stalled on the railroad tracks, the train came and plowed into his car, and it burst into flames, and he, he was burned alive. And so she became very angry, she became depressed, and then said she was an atheist because she couldn't believe that if there was a God, that God would allow this to happen. But after I allowed her to tell me more about her story, then she was able to begin to find some healing in her life, and she eventually returned to the church. So to me, if somebody is a true atheist, absolutely, they can go to hell. But in today's world, people may use that word just for shock value or to get your attention. So I always want to have more of a conversation with that person and saying, can you tell me more about why you say you are an atheist? Thank you for that information, Father. And again, from Prince Acosta, how did the saints battle the devil and how can we learn from their holiness? You know, we don't have to do anything extraordinary to defeat the devil. It's the very ordinary aspects of our Catholic faith. If one is going to Mass, pray, receiving the sacraments and reading the Bible, the devil is already on the run. And the lives of the saints are people who teach us the importance of living out the core values and aspects of our Catholic faith, whether it be the Ten Commandments, the corporal works of mercy, the Beatitudes. So again, we don't have to do anything extraordinary but to live out our faith. And if we do that, 
the devil will be on the run. And when we look at the lives of the saints, I think that's the important lesson that we learn from them. If we give God his rightful place in our life, then the devil is nothing to fear. Amen. And from Mich Michelle Mitch, what is, uh, is there a different level of third eye? Yeah, that can become very complicated because sometimes people will get caught up in things like the third eye, other occult activities, and it may be what I would call an introductory level. Maybe people think that it's fun and entertaining, but that's a way to lead people into a, you know, a deeper level of those practices. So I would say that absolutely, maybe somebody begins something that seems to be fun and entertaining, but it pulls them into a much darker and deeper world of the demonic. Because there's a lot of things, you know, people think, well, like tarot cards or playing with a Ouija board. Yes. Ah, that's, just, that's just harmless fun. But again, those are ways that the devil tries to get our attention to lure us deeper into his world of deception and lies. So there are different levels of the third eye and any type of other occult activities where the devil is really trying to cause our lives to spiral out of control. Mm. Um, I'm curious, Father, uh, just to follow up this the, the question. Because the saint assists angels, what's the difference uh, between the ter uh, an occult and from God? Yeah, and then the thing is, right, the, the answer is right what you just said. Where is it coming from? Yeah. Is it coming from God or is it coming from the devil, from the evil one? So what is the source of that? Because that now, you know, the, the notion of a third eye is having greater wisdom or insight. And the question is, where is it coming from? Here's a good example. You know, in the Old Testament, Moses goes in front of Pharaoh and says, mm -hmm. God says to let my people go. What happened to the staff in Moses' hand? It turns into a serpent. Sneak. Yeah. And what happens? The, the Pharaoh's magicians are able to do the same thing. Their staff turns into a snake as well. But what's the difference between the two? If the fact is that Moses is a man of God. It's not what he's doing. It's what God is doing in and through him. Because even then, Moses' staff that turned into the snake consumes the snake that the the Christians uh, had you know, formed out of their own staffs. So again, it's always the question of who is acting? Is it God or the devil? And any activity of God is going to help people grow in holiness and virtue. And any activity of the devil is going to cause people to move further and further away from God. Because there are, as you say, there are mystics in the church. Mm -hmm. They receive special gifts and charisms. But again, it's not what they're doing on their own. It's what God is doing in and through them. So it's a gift from God. God is working in and through them. And any of the mystics of the church, the focus is never on themselves. They never say, look at me, look at what I can do. You know, that's the sin of pride. They're always pointing to God. Look at what God is doing through, in and through me. Look at what God is doing. But whenever the focus is on ourself, when people have these gifts or charisms, to me, that's an indication that is coming from the devil and not from God. From Lei Le Valuiv, what can you say about yoga? The practice of yoga, you know, the church frowns on that practice because it's coming out of uh, Eastern spirituality. People will say to me, well, Father, you know, yoga is just exercise. But again, this is how the devil can subtly get a foothold into our lives. There's nothing wrong with exercise. But then do people get caught up in the spirituality connected to it? You know, the word yoga means yoke. So what are people yoking themselves to in the practice of yoga? You know, Jesus himself says, you know, my burden is easy, you know, and my yoke is light. Yeah. So again, the importance of connecting ourselves to Christ. But in the practice of yoga, some of the postures are actually forms of worship to different Hindu deities. Now, people may not realize that. Yes. They may get caught up in the exercise. But again, 
when anybody does something, they should fully understand what it is that they're doing. I've known many people who got who started doing yoga and then eventually left the church because they got caught up in the spirituality associated with yoga, and that spirituality became more important than going to Mass or celebrating the sacraments of the church. And again, that's an indication of how subtle the devil works. Mm. Oftentimes he gets us off the right path. We've been off of it for quite some time, and we don't even realize it. That's true of the practice of Reiki as well. You know, Reiki relies on this power, this energy. But if it's not the Holy Spirit, then what is it? And the church would say it's the power and presence of the devil. So whether it's yoga, whether it's Reiki, these things are inconsistent with our Catholic faith. Again, exercise is good, but there are many other ways that we can exercise without calling it yoga. Wow. Thank you for for sharing that information, Father. From Lola Cordapia. I love the way he explained about exorcism with you more. My question is, how can we fight against occultism and belief which many Filipinos are practicing or inherited from their ancestors? I, I meet many Catholics who are practicing this kind of healing or protection through occultism or ritual acts. Which is not right and contrary, con which is not right and contrary to God's teaching. Yeah, that's the challenge of evangelization. Goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where mm -hmm. people say that they're devout Catholics, yeah, and they're still doing activities that are contrary to the Catholic faith. You know, rather than telling people that what they're doing is wrong, because if you just do that, people will go on the defensive. It's more important to help people come to an understanding of why those occult practices are inconsistent with our Catholic faith. And then when people have a better understanding, hopefully then they would make the decision to turn away from those practices and to turn more closely to God. Because, you know, the, the truth is we cannot serve both God and the devil at the same time. And when people are claiming to be Catholic and going to, to Mass on Sunday, but then involved in occult activities throughout the week, that is an inconsistency. And it's really a form of idolatry. And that's a violation of the very first commandment, where God says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no strange gods before me. And when people turn to the world of the occult, they're really looking for a substitute for God. And you know, idolatry, I believe, is the main sin that God condemns in the Old Testament. You know, the Israelites were always, think of the golden calf, yes. the sacred poles and pillars that people were erecting on the mountains. And God wanted to remove all those forms of idolatry so that people would come to worship the one true God. And so any form of occultism really is a form of idolatry. Yes, especially here in uh, Philippines, Father, there are so many pagan practices uh, which uh, our ancestors been passed in, in our generation. Father, from Alex D, is there such thing as exercising a nation? Yes, absolutely. Oh, mm. There can be prayers. In fact, I know that in uh, Mexico a few years ago, the uh, Mexican Bishops' Conference uh, had an exorcism performed over the entire country because of the uh, all the drug problems. So yes, exorcisms can be prayed over an entire country. The bishops would have that authority. So like the Filipino Bishops' Conference, for the United States, it would be the United States Bishops' Conference. So in Mexico, it was the Mexican Bishops' Conference that decided that a very special prayer was needed to address the uh, rampant problem of drugs in the country. But what's the effect? It's about, you know, every, every exorcism prayer provides some benefit. Even if evil is not completely cast out yes. and is weakened, because ultimately God will determine when the demons will be cast out. 
So we're always operating on God's timing. Because, you know, as an exorcist, I don't have any special powers or abilities. You know, the, the power relies in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And the authority that he has given to the church and to the church's ministers. So ultimately, God is always in control. And God may be delaying the expulsion of the demon for whatever greater good that God has. Amen. From Alex Lee again, how to heal a family tree from a uh, generational curse? Yeah, curses are only effective, I like to tell people, if we're weak in our faith. Because we can't control what other people do. But we can make sure, as St. Paul tells us, that we're putting on the full armor of Christ. So again, if we're living out our faith. So there are prayers that can be prayed. You know, all of us can be impacted by the sins of those who came before us. But we don't have to live in those in that sin. Because we know, again, the power of Jesus Christ is greater than the power of evil forces. So one can say a prayer to renounce that those satanic ties. One can say a prayer to break an ungodly vow or pact that an ancestor has made. Uh, we do have the authority. You know, we, we hear in Scripture, in the book of Exodus, where it says the sins of the father are passed down to the third yes. and fourth generation. But remember the most important thing. It also says the blessings are passed down to the thousandth generation. Amen. So that's greater, three or a thousand is greater than three or four. Yes. So again, always rely on the power of blessing. So anyone who believes there any type of generational sin or curse within the family can go through deliverance prayers and even say these prayers on their own, breaking that hold that the demonic has over their family line. Ah, oh, wow. And uh, from Clary Salem, uh, my question, what does an exorcist feel while doing the exorcism? What does an exorcist feel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Initially fear, but not anymore. After 18 years again, Yeah. feels the power of God at work. Hmm. You know, I've seen all kinds of manifestations, as I told you. They don't even bother me anymore. I don't, I don't think about them. and They don't keep me up at night. So what I feel is truly the power of God at work in the lives of these people who are suffering. Wow. Amen. From Re Re Regina Cecilia, can any religious person do deliverance, especially in his own family or in the community, even if he is not the head of the community? Especially in our op open age, we hold sometimes there are children who see spirits and they are afraid and ask and ask ask for help. God bless and thank you. I think anyone who has authority over a family, or in that case, like an orphanage, because obviously those children don't have any families. They don't even know who their father or their mother may be. So anyone who has a level of authority can pray for those people on their behalf. Certainly within the family, it would be the head of the family that can pray and take that authority. But I would, I would say that anyone who is at an orphanage who has some type of authority, who has taken on a parental role, if you will, in the lives of children who don't have a family, has that authority to pray over them and to give them the protection they need through deliverance prayers. Oh, so every head of the family, like me, I'm a father, so I can uh, deliver... Absolutely, absolutely, because you have, yeah, again, your role within the family and the authority that, that that role gives you, you can certainly pray over your family. Um, how about Father Beans, if you're if you're an uh, educator, a teacher from, from a school, is this, uh, is, it, is it also possible to do a deliverance? I would say that's a different... I think I would say that would be different because those mm. children in school would still have parents or a family that have the greater authority over them and no one else can take the place of that family. Again, the exception may be like for those in an orphanage where again, the people that work there are taking on a parental role. 
But for those in the school, I would say it still goes back to their parents who have the ultimate authority over them. I see. Uh, from Jerome Castaneda, how do you determine if, you, if you're financially cursed? How do you overcome or clean yourself from, fin- from being financially cursed? Yeah, I think that would go back to maybe that generational curses or sin again. Was there a curse in the, in the family line that's causing things not to work out? But I would also go back to my story about Job. Just because things aren't working out the way that we want, we shouldn't just automatically assume that the devil is trying to do something to us. Yes. You know, we shouldn't blame everything on the, the devil. devil. <laughs> it's not healthy to see the devil everywhere. We really need to see the, we really need to see God everywhere. Yeah. So if somebody is experiencing, you know, financial problems or crises or whatever it might be, then to look at it from every possible angle. You know, is God permitting this to happen? Is this yeah. truly the result of being cursed? Is it the result of just poor financial planning, whatever it might be? But to look at it from every possible angle, because again, regardless of our circumstances, we just need to make sure that we're giving God his rightful place in our lives. Amen. From uh, Mother Mother Reza, uh, please ask if there was a noticeable increase in cases of demonic obsession, possession these past few years. Absolutely. It has increased dramatically. You know, prior to COVID-19, I was receiving 2,000 requests for help a year, but now it's 3,500. I think during COVID-19, a lot of people found themselves in isolation, and the devil really works in isolation. You know, if you think about Adam and Eve, when yeah. the serpent tried to trick them, not when they were together, but when they were separated. Mm-hmm. So the importance of community. And you know... Here in the United States, I'm not sure about the Philippines, but there are many Catholics that are still struggling to come back to church, even though everything's been reopened. Yes. And again, because they got so accustomed to that isolation, they don't really want to come back to church anymore. And that's presented a unique challenge for the church in the United States is how can we reach out to these people who have become disconnected uh, in recent years? But yeah, I would say absolutely demonic activity has increased, which also raises the question people have asked me, did the devil cause COVID-19? Yeah. (laughs) And the answer is, we don't know. Again, the devil is an opportunist, so he can take advantage of any situation to try to advance his kingdom. And I think the devil certainly took advantage of everything that was happening during all the lockdowns yeah. as a way to advance his kingdom and to get people disconnected from God. Because again, ultimately, the devil wants all of us to live as if God did not exist. Amen. And uh, Father, uh, from the super nurse, do demons always have to ask permission from God if he wants to torment someone? They don't God, God permits them to do certain things. You know, demons can't do whatever they want. If they could, the world would be a lot more chaotic than it already is. So they're still kept on a leash, we can say, so they can only do so much which God permits. And again, so if they're attacking someone, obviously God is permitting that. And God may be permitting it because somebody misused their free will. You know, God wants all of us to use our free will to make the choice for him. But God respects our free will. So if we make the choice for evil, then God will permit demons to afflict us. It's not what God desires, but God will permit it because he respects our free will. Wow. And Father, uh, maybe last. this is the last question. So, the whole world knows the devastating earthquake that happened in Syria and Turkey that killed thousands of lives and destroyed the lives of the people there. Many say, many say where is God these days? Why did he let it? I would say evil happens because we live in a fallen world. Going all the way back to Adam and Eve, 
when we chose to be disobedient to God, then the consequences of that were that death entered into the world. Remember the serpent said to Eve, when, you know, presenting the forbidden fruit, surely you will not die, you will become like gods. But that was a lie because what was the result of the sin? Death entered into the world. And we constantly experience that now. Again, God is not the author of death. God is not the one who causes the pain and suffering in our lives. But God is the one who can help us make sense out of all of that and begin to put our lives back together. I think of Psalm 23, where it says, Even though I walk through the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. So God never promised that we wouldn't experience darkness, such as these earthquakes, but he did promise that he would always be with us at our side. So to me, where is God in the midst of these tragedies? It's the people that are coming to uh, rescue those who are trapped. It's the outpouring of support, you know, people making donations to the Red Cross or Catholic Relief yeah. Services. It's humanity given the opportunity to show our solidarity with one another. Amen. Have you seen the, the, the movie, The Pope Exorcist? I have not seen that. I know a trailer just dropped. Yeah, the trailer just uh, came out. I, I have not seen that yet, but it's about the life of Father Gabriel Amor. Yeah. I do know that, but I have not had the opportunity to see that yet. I think there's some question about in any movie that's made on exorcism, are they really focused on the power of God or are they yeah. really focused on the power of evil? And usually a lot of these shows focus on the power of evil because people are fascinated by that. You know, the joke amongst exorcists is if you're going to give a talk about Jesus, 20 people will show up. But if you're going to talk about the devil, 200 people will show up. <laughs> yeah. It's that greater fascination with the evil one. So I've not seen that yet. The Pope's Exorcist, but it will be interesting to see where the true focus is on the devil or on the power of God. So do you uh, recommend uh, that movie if it will show in the in the in the, in the theater? I think, yes, I think it's always good to watch these movies, and even if they're not good, we can always learn something and how to apply it to our lives of faith. Uh, thank you so much for all the information that you share, uh, Father Vince. Uh, such a blessing and a wonderful experience. I, I mean, all the practical uh, sharing and your experiences. I mean, it's uh, a gem for all of us, Father. And maybe, Father, you have something you want to, to promote to our viewers. The only thing I would want to promote is our relationship with God. I think that's the most important thing is for people to think about their relationship with God and to realize that that relationship is really the most important thing. And then for people to examine their lives and if there's anything in their lives that is contrary to God, we need to begin to root that out. Doesn't mean it may happen overnight, but that's the pathway that all of us really should begin walking. So whether it's me speaking about exorcism, whether it's you, Adrian, and the fantastic work that you're doing, it's really helping to awaken people to the important role that God wants to play in their lives. You know, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And I think all of us who work for the ministry of God are wanting people to realize God is knocking at your door. And we are the ones who need to open that door and let him in. God doesn't kick the door down and say, here I am. He respects our freedom. But he's knocking and he wants us to let him in. And I think that anyone who is working for the church is trying to help people drown out the noise of the demonic in their life so that they can hear that knock and invite God into their life. And really, that's what I try to do through the ministry of exorcism. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much, Father. And if, uh, can we ask for a closing prayer and... Uh, your blessing for all of us. Yes, in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for this opportunity, for having come together today. We pray that each and every one of us will truly open that door and invite you more deeply into our lives and to experience the incredible things 
that you want to work in our lives and in the lives of those whom we love and care for and respect. Bless everyone who has listened here today and send your blessing upon them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Vince Lampert, for this opportunity for blessing our viewers and answering our our question. It helped us so much, especially in times that uh, we see so much evil, especially here in social media. But when we see a man of God like you, uh, Father Vince, we are so ins- inspired. Yeah. And uh, and I would hope, and I would hope that. A conversation today will really challenge people to think about their faith. So I always like to say that hopefully the conversation today will really challenge people to look at their lives and to say, am I walking with the Lord? And if I am, how can I walk more closely with the Lord? Wow. Thank you so much, Father. God bless you. Thank you. Pray for you. And I need it. Thank you. I'll be praying yeah. for you. And for all the people there in the Philippines. Yes. And we are looking forward to see you in person. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. God willing, one day. Amen. In God's time. Yes, absolutely. Thank you again, Father Vince. And have a nice day. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. God bless. Take care. God bless. What can you comment about this? That if the devil can cannot make you bad he will make you busy <laughs> <laughs> yes the devil is an opportunist para magkaroon ka ng access sa content na ito be part of my patreon group at i-click mo lang ang gold membership ma-access mo na ang buong video talk na ito alam mo ba na pag ikaw ay naging part ng aking patreon group ay matutulungan mo ako makapag-produce pa ng mga high quality content na katulad ng pinapanood mo ngayon at sobrang makakatulong ito sa ating online evangelization dito sa ministry na ginagawa natin para mas ma-empower nyo ako makapag-produce ng mas marami pang content na alam ko na makakatulong sa inyong pananampalatayang katoliko. Thank you and God bless. So that's it. Thank you for watching this video. I hope na na-bless at na-inspire ka dito sa aking vlog. Make sure na i-like mo at mag-comment ka sa baba ng video na to. At mag-subscribe ka sa aking YouTube channel para lagi ka updated sa mga bagong vlog na gagawin ko. At huwag mo din kakalimutan na i-like ang aking page. So this been Adrian Milag encouraging you to live your life to the fullest. God bless you more abundantly.